So, Father, as we come to reverence you, Father God, and to obey you, to cling to you, Father God, for you are our life in our length of days. Father, we thank you for your divine plan of redemption. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to pay a horrible price for Adam's transgressions. Father, we want to worship you and praise you. Now, as we submit it to you, Father God, and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, now, Satan, we resist you in Jesus' name. That includes every principality, every power, and every ruler of the darkness of this world. We forbid you to manifest yourself in this place or be around this place as long as we're here in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Anything that does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh cannot be around this place when we're here in Jesus' name. I said in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you, dear Lord Jesus. We worship you, sir. You are the head. We're a part of your body. As you direct the service of stage, John 16, 13, you said, all the Father has is yours. But the Holy Spirit would take from you and reveal, declare, and show us things to come. So we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We accept you as being in charge. I give you permission. Uh, now I would ask that you cause my tongue to be that of a ready writer, as the prophet of old has said. Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory and honor. We do covet the best gift, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. We desire spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Father, in Jesus' name. So, Father, we want to praise you and thank you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome to move and manifest yourself severally as you will. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Saint said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen, amen. <laughs> God is good. I said, God is, a, God is a good God. Yeah, I remember I kept hearing Oral Roberts years ago when I was just into this, but some ministries just get so mad at Oral for saying God's a good God. I could never figure that out. It just it doesn't make sense. Jesus said there's no one good but God. But yet you have ministers, I'm talking about Pentecostal ministers, they're saying, you don't want to say, well, I guess they think God's still doing the bad things. God's not doing the bad things. But anyway, there's this, uh, maybe in a week or two, not, not next week, because next week is uh, Memorial Weekend, but also Pentecost Weekend. So, but maybe the following weekend, I'm going to start teaching again uh, a little bit on healing one of these times. I'm not sure when exactly, but I'm really impressed down the road. We, we need divine healing technicians out of here. We need to be trained up how to deal with sickness, disease, and people that are terminal. You know, I mean, people just like Don Raymond, they had divine healing technicians. That's what I want to start coming out of here. You all are here for a purpose. You all have access to the Holy Spirit. You have access to the Word of God. God has anointed and equipped every person to do what he calls us to do. Jesus said, John 14, 12, we will do the works he did. And even greater because he went back to his heavenly father. So God expects, Jesus expects us to do and continue on the ministry, the present day ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our obligation. We're supposed to be doing those things. And because uh, uh, one of the things we need to be teaching on eventually is when healing doesn't come. And that's the reality we have to face. But now is God a respecter of persons or have we approached him incorrectly? See, God... God's not a respecter of persons, but so people need to be taught what the Word of God says. And once you know, because the truth will set you free. So that's why it's an imperative, I believe. And we see so much things happening in this world right now, so much sickness, disease, and cancers are just running rampant and everything else. But God's still God, and we have a covenant with God. We have blood covenant rights. So we need to take our place and do what we're supposed to do. So that's one of the things that we're going to be teaching very shortly. But the other day I was... Uh, as I was praying after after Wednesday's service, and Wednesday we try, I've been trying to do some teaching on the Jubilee, and what it means, and especially the end time Jubilee. God is, I mean, the more I study this, the more God is so awesome. I can't think things are there. We just haven't we just haven't seen them. We don't understand the things that was number one the Hebrew. We don't understand a lot of that. But to, so it means I've got to study and dig a whole lot because when I hear something from a rabbi, I have to go back into Scripture to find out where it's at. I'm not just going to tell you something that I don't know what it doesn't say scripturally. So that's why, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of, it's a lot of fun to do, but it's a lot, it's a lot of hard work, but praise God. Anyway, but the other day as I was praying about uh, Thursday, I said, Lord, I don't know what you want done for th Sunday. I never do. I would usually until Thursday sometime or sometime even Friday or Saturday. But uh, I kept hearing, and let's turn to John's gospel chapter and four, the woman with, at, with the well, a Samaritan woman. I remember she was a Samaritan, but Samaritans were half breeds. And anyway, we're going to read a few of these scriptures here, but I want to, uh, uh, let's start with the verse. Uh, well, I want to back up a little bit here, I guess. Well, verse 7, Jesus uh, came to her and said, give me to drink. 
And for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman in Samaria said to him, how is that you being a Jew asked a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God, and we do know, we do know and we have received the gift of God. <clears throat> I see on Facebook sometimes, what, what gift has God given you? I always put down eternal life. He, sent, he gave me Jesus Christ. That's the best gift you could ever have. The most important decision you'll ever make in your life is not who you're going to marry. That's important. But the most decision is whether you accept Christ or not, whether you're going to heaven or where you're going to hell. That's the most important decision. Jobs are important, yes. But the, your eternal salvation, that's the most important. <clears throat> and I uh, said, if you would ask of him, he would give you living water. <clears throat> The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the well is deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I give him will be, be a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. That's talking about the new birth. So when you're born again, you have a abundance of water coming up on it, life coming up on the inside, springing up on the inside of you. But we remember we go to John chapter 7, which we're not probably going to go today, but verse 37 on, where Jesus spoke on the great day of the feast. If any man thirsts, he said, out of, it, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, which he spoke concerning the Holy Ghost who had not yet been given because Jesus had been crucified, resurrected. <clears throat> but anyway, the woman said, sir, uh, give me this water that I may drink it uh, and it may not have to draw. Jesus said, go call your husband and have him come. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you have well said I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. The one you're living with now is not is truly not your husband. You have said truly. The woman said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you say Jews that, and the Jews say that you worship in Jerusalem in the place of where, where you ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship God on this mountain nor in Jerusalem where, where you worship the Father. You will worship, you worship, verse 22 is the one I'm going to get at today. You worship what you do not know. We know who we worship for salvation is of the Jews. If it wasn't for the Jews, we wouldn't have any, we wouldn't be around. There would be no Christians. So we have to get back to our base. <clears throat> but the hour comes now is when true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the spot, Father is seeking such who will worship him. For God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And if we go to, uh, I'm going to back up real quickly, go to Acts chapter 17. When Paul was in Athens, and uh, there were, he went to the synagogue, but also as he passed by, you know, there was a lot of believing Jews and, and Gentiles there. But there was also a lot of pagan worship. And uh, starting with verse, uh, whoops, oh, too many chapters here. Uh, so with verse 23, I guess. So passing through the, uh, considering the, the object of your worship, I found at your altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing is him who I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it is, since the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one man, blood from every nation of, of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he determined how to point of time and the boundaries of the other dwellings. The point of it is many people don't know who they worship. They go to church on Sundays. Thank God for that. But they think they're worshiping. God. They don't know him. They know of him. They go, they worship him mentally. It's not out of the heart. True worship is from the heart, not the head. That's why when we get into praise, praise is right. We're supposed to, when you praise, you're giving God adoration. You're magnifying him. You're exalting him. But when you get into true worship, in fact, the one word for worship, if I can find it here real quickly, is uh, pros, proskuno, the, the Greek word. The first part, pros, means to press toward. Kuno means to kiss or push toward intimacy. In other words, when we're in, when you worship God, you're in, intimate with God. You're you're moving in a place where your heart, you're worshiping out of your heart. You're loving God from your heart. It's not a head knowledge thing. It's a heart knowledge. True worship comes out of your spirit. The more you start praising and thanking God, back in Psalm 22 and 3, 
uh, says God inhabits the praises of his people. But another trans other translation, the little Hebrew talks about God. Bring that back. Okay, 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 okay. Where's it here? I even wrote it down. Somewhere. <laughs> okay. Anyway, his temple is the is, uh, is, he writes on the writes on the temple of praise. Is basically what it's saying. In other words, when we start praising him and worshiping him, he inhabits his praises. The, the glory comes down. The more we exalt God and praise him from the heart, that's when things start to happen. The more believers get together. When you I've been in meetings with five, ten thousand more. When, when believers get together and start praising God, great manifestations happen. It can happen here. The more we get into a true praise and worship, we start praising God from our heart, things will begin to happen. Manifestations will come. God desires to show himself strong. And every when you know, in the early church, they came together to give. A lot of times people come to church nowadays to get. Well, there's nothing wrong with getting because you should come to get whatever you need. Philippians 4, 19. We should also come to give. You give of your heart. You give of your, your presence. You give of your sacrifice to come. It's not always easy to come. But see, you're coming to serve God. You're coming to honor him. Well, I can honor him. I don't have to come to church. You don't know you don't have to. Now, I'll think about how God looks at that. You don't want to take the time to go to church. You'll find uh, excuses. No, I can worship at home. Yes, you can. But God said to come fellowship. He said, said in Hebrews 10, 25, neglect not to summon together. Under the old covenant, you were mandatory. You had to go to worship. See, they were spiritually dead people. But the more they served God and worshiped him, God took care of them continually. He, they prospered everything they put their hand unto. That's why in Deuteronomy 28, that wasn't just for the Jewish people because we are blessed with believing Abraham. Is that right? Well, in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, if we're Christ, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, then you're Abraham's seed and your heirs according to all the promises. So in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, God says, he'll bless you, you're coming in, you're going out, but also he said, the blessings will come upon you and overtake you. When we cut together and gather together in Jesus' name, great and mighty things will happen. You should be expecting, when you come, wherever you go, God goes. Because yeah? he's on the inside of you. And the more of us get together, the more we get in unity of the faith, the more things will happen in the spirit realm. God desires to move and manifest himself. He's waiting for the church to wake up. There was a wake-up call. Meg Julie talked about her mention when we, before we had leave down uh, Peoria. The wake-up call. Moral Roberts had the vision in 2004. It's time for the church to wake up because the time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter before God can say, son, go home and bring my children home before that trumpet sounds and the angel shouts out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and there be the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive will meet, meet the Lord in the air and will be transformed instantaneously into a glorified body. Not every man is going to see death. It also says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, and and we, all, we all know death is an enemy. Well, God, God didn't design man to die. Man, man was designed to be eternal. God created him that way, but because of sin, death took over. Spiritual, physical. That wasn't God's plan. And of course, we realize well, once we're in, once after the we're in heaven, but once once after the thousand year reign and, we're in God, and the new heaven, and new earth comes down, we're with God for eternity, eternity, and all the saints together. <clears throat> you realize you don't have to worry about taking a nap and sleeping. <laughs> Hello, you won't be sleeping up there. Spirit, spirits are your when you go when your physical body takes a nap at night or takes goes to sleep, your spirit's still alive and. and, and that's why when people, I encourage people, when someone's in a coma, you go to the hospital, be careful what you say. Their spirit, you pick it up. Their spirit will hear. That's why I tell people when you go there, speak life into them. Because it causes the spirit man on the inside to rise up. You don't speak words that, well, they're going to die and they're not going to make it. No, no. Keep your big bad mouth shut. They hear, they'll hear enough of that from the doctors and nurses. But thank God, but when you... Because I've been having to recently uh, ask to pray for people. I said, well, we, they're not out of the area. But I said, have people speak life into them. I give them scriptures to speak to them, into their spirit man. Because God is a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a physical body. 
So your the spirit is alive. For, when a person dies, their their outer garment, their body lays down temporarily, but the spirit man is still alive. You're either going to heaven or hell. There's, there's only two places to go. So God is a spirit. He first of all created man. He, when he blew into Adam, the breaths, not breath, breaths of life. Not only the air for him to start breathing, but also he breathed the spirit into him. Spirits are eternal. They don't just disappear, dissolve. That's why people have don't have God. They have no hope about the hereafter because they don't know and they don't understand anything. They think once you're dead, you're dead as a dog. No, no. Spirits are eternal. But and we have to be preaching what the word of God says to speak to people's spirits on a continuum. But when 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 you're around someone and God gives you maybe a word to say to someone, speak it. Remember first or first Corinthians chapter three? He said, Paul said, one sows, one other waters, but God gives the increase. So you can sow a word in someone's life, whether they seem like they accept it or not, whether they reject it or not. It goes into their spirit, man. To the physical man, their mind's gonna say, I don't believe that junk or that garbage. I don't think I understand that, you know. But in here, after a while, somebody else comes by and waters that word that was sown. Pretty soon. Fruit starts to grow. Fruit starts to grow. So we got to start speaking. When people, it's, 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 there's been polls taken out from Christians in different different groups, but 50% of the churches are, are losing people. Population of the churches are going down. It should The mainline church, that should not be that way. But the Bible talks about a great falling away. But see, people are tired of religious mumbo jumbo, nothing's happening. That's why when you know not, I'm not trying to not church it, but when you man has got an organization, when they started changing things around back around 300 AD, a little after that, pretty soon man starts getting their own doctrines in there. And Jesus said in John chapter 15, Mark chapter 7, for teaching the doctrines, the commandments of men, you nullify the word of God, you make it of none effect. So God cannot, God can't move contrary to his word. He can wait. Let's when, when the Lord appeared to Brother Hagan in 2000 or 2000, 1987, we were. That was our first year down at Ramah. And in camp meeting that year, just a few days prior, the Lord appeared to him in a vision. And uh, it took him over to there was the vision. He saw the, the convention center there in Tulsa. And uh, uh, he said, come up here. When they stood at the top of the convention center, and he looking down, and saw people down and different things. And the Lord talked about uh, how the church had been substituting brass for gold. Well, you remember when Solomon built a temple, it was not only gold, it was pure gold. Well, we know that, that was taken, the gold was taken out of there, but Rehoboam put in brass. Brass is not a regular alloy, it's a combination of copper and zinc. It's not pure. It looks nice, but it's not pure. But so the church has the church through the ages, especially with the different thing, but the charismatic movement was a great thing to happen. People came from all walks of life, wanting more of God, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they get baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And their people are being healed and delivered, and all things are starting to happen. And they get, but they're bringing in goofy doctrines, the doctrines of the, the program dance, you know, organized dance. Even when it first started, I first started in our home church in Rockford was doing it. In here, I mean, I know, I know when the spirit of God is moving. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with it. the natural, but that's not, that's not, that wasn't of God. You can't program a dance before God. Now, under the old covenant, they danced before the Lord. Before the Lord. So we're supposed to be dancing in the Lord or within this by the Spirit of God. It's not something you think up. It's not something you practice. It's something that happens. You saw a few weeks ago, I think the ones you saw some of the Raymond singers and band when they started dancing in the Holy Ghost. Their feet were going like a mile a minute, like a jackhammer. <laughs> That's, you don't go to a rhythm of music. When the Holy Ghost causes you to dance. You, you're going to know it. Your feet going to come alive. You're going to just get going. Well, but... So the church has suffered a lot of those things for many. I think not too many churches practice that anymore. I don't think. I don't know. But that was a big thing for a long time, and the waving of flags and all these things. People meant well, but what it did, it grieves the Holy Ghost. It quenches the Spirit, so God can't move. And also in the clapping. People sometimes get clap happy. You get to big meetings, and when something starts happening, God's moving, whether it be through a prophetic word or the gifts of healings or whatever, people start clapping and shouting. The anointing lifts. It grieves the Holy Ghost. That's not worship. I mean, God, number number one, God doesn't interrupt God. 
when I'm, when I'm minister, preaching the word ministry and somebody injects stuff, that's the, that's, you don't interrupt the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a time when we allow things to happen, but otherwise, people I've seen with Brother Hagen meetings down there at, 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 at Raymond one not too many years ago before he went on to be home, but most of us pretty much all Holy Ghost filled Raymond people, most of them. But he was stepped into the prophet's office, and as soon as he started prophesying, people start have a few people, not a whole lot, a few people started clapping and shouting. It, lift, it lifted right away. And you could tell it's like a bird. It was like, it was, it was like somebody threw cold water over the whole place. See, it was inappropriate. I mean, that's the that's flesh. You can't hear what the prophet's saying. He never got to finish. God got interrupted. He never got, he never heard what he had to say. Therefore, people missed out. So that sometimes, of course, he will correct people sometimes. He had to. One time, one time in, in class, it was our first year. And uh, we had a lot of good students there, but he, he stepped out in the prophet's office during class one day. And all of a sudden, a couple, a couple of people started shouting and running. That got put down pretty quick. <laughs> he did it in a nice way. He did it in a nice way. But they're out, you're out of order. And people, people mean well, and there's time, there's a time. There's actually a time to run in the Holy Ghost. There is a time, <clears throat> but it wouldn't it wouldn't disturb the Spirit of God when the Spirit of God is moving in a certain way. Now, if God, if God is moving and people start running, and everybody else won't watch what's happening, they're, just, they're paying attention to what God's doing. That's a little different. But too many times when people start running, we used to, in our home church in Rock, we had the twins of the twin twin. <laughs> One was. A, I, I can say it in a nice way. He's a nut. I don't know. He's a nut. <laughs> the other one's pretty sober and sober most of the time. He never hardly ever smiled. The other one laughed all the time and was very smiling. But boy, they take off running. They just run around the place. But we just flesh. Because after, after the service, nothing had changed within them. They didn't get anything. So it's all a matter of show. Some people want to be seen that God's moving on them. Well, that's just immaturity, immaturity. But see, we're supposed to know who we worship. And when you know him, Jesus said, in John chapter 8, verse 32, when you know the truth, that means you're intimate with it. It means you're, we are supposed to be intimate with God and with our heart. You're talking to God out of your heart. Now, there's time we start with God out of our head. Yes, you wake up in the morning, your, your mind's going, I'm ready to go back to sleep. Maybe you start praising him, but inside your heart, the more you do that, inside pretty soon starts to bubble up on the inside of you. You start, a form of worship starts coming up. You start thinking of, pretty soon, your mind is not thinking on the things where your body's feeling or what's you got to do today, but you're thinking you're focusing on God. So things are different. So I think with Smith Wigglesworth, he never stepped his foot out of bed without worshiping God. Well, when you raise the dead over 20 times, he walks in close fellowship with God. Yeah. But he never went 10 to 15 minutes without either praying or reading the Bible. One time he's being picked up and driven somewhere and they're driving down the road and, and all of a sudden he said, stop, stop. And the guy, Jammed all his brakes full over. He said, What's the matter? He said, We've gone 15 minutes having praise God. So he praised God off the side of the road for a minute. Said, okay, now you can go. Took off and went. But see, he had such a close relationship with God that comes through fellowshipping and worshiping Him, knowing who He is. Even so many believers still don't really know who God is. We have a glimpse of God, we kind of have an idea what He's like. But the more we spend time in His Word and fellowship, we'll start knowing who we're really worshiping. We will not be like the people that don't know. They're going through a form of religion, like Paul said in Timothy, but denying the power thereof. We should be expecting the power because God is all power. Everything he does is power. So when God's on the move, power's on the move. So lives are supposed to change. change people's hearts are supposed to change. Their thinking should change. We have to change our thinking with the word of God. But again, many people, hold your place there, but instead of quoting it, I'm going to read it. Because when it comes to things, the things of God or knowing God or what God's doing nowadays, well, I think this and I think that, but in Isaiah chapter 55, verse, well, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he's still near. And let's jump down to verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as high as, as heaven is high, higher than the earth, so are my ways and your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, does not return there, but the waters of the earth and makes it bring forth bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but will accomplish and prosper wherein to I send it. Well, 
religious religious people and denominations. So again, they have thoughts of God, what God is doing, what God did. That was, but that was back in the, the old day. God has changed. My Bible says God's never changed. He said, "I'm the Lord thy God; I change not." Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The Word never changes. The Holy Ghost never changes. So who changes? Man. As I was in my first year, we had to study church history. <clears throat> we went back and we, well, we go back to the Dark Ages with that in the 200, but the, the, then on 300 on, it was it was where the church started getting Gentile. And you, as you say through each century, how the different parts of the church started coming up with these different doctrines and ideas and and things. And that's why the church got divided so many times. They got away from bases. They got away from God because man's doctrines, they used to have councils. Council of Trent and different things. You know, God's doing, we think God's doing this. God's doing this. God, you know, God never moves apart from his word. Well, God's doing a new thing. Might be new to you, but it's, it's still be in the word. God's going to show himself strong. That's in the word. God's going to manifest power. That's in the word. The latter house is going to be greater than the former house. That's in the word. The glory is going to get greater. That's in the word. The former rain, the latter rain, the former latter rain combined. That's in the word. So we can expect such more manifestations that we've never seen. But it's still God. Because he's, he's, he's everything. <laughs> I don't know how else I can put this in a decent terminology. God is everything. He consumes all things. God is good, and everything about God is good. So when we speak the things of God, we should know that God is a good God. The bad things that happen in our lives are not of God. We know, in fact, in, in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes about for to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said in B, yes, that was verse A, A, B, 10A, B of that verse, Jesus Christ came to give you life and give it more abundantly. The amplified of life with joy, the full overflows. We also know in 2 Corinthians 2.14, he, he always causes us to triumph. Hello? No, no, sometimes, no, always. Always we have an opportunity for victory. Romans 8.37, you're more than a conqueror. And I always give the illustration because I used to love boxing. I don't anymore. I, back, in the, you know, back in the day, I used to love good pugilism, you know. But but when I see what it does to people's brains and the concussions they get, and as I don't even like football anymore because of the damage, the brain damage that happens. I don't like it. But anyway, where was I going? Yeah, get mad. Thank you. <laughs> get a lot here. But I used to because I used to think a heavyweight boxer. He would train and train and train for a fight months in advance. Sacrifice himself, get up early, road work, bag work, uh, no no life outside, of the, focusing on what he's got to do, training hard, training hard for those months, gets in the ring, wins the fight, gets the money, gives it to his wife, she's more than a conqueror. She didn't have to do through the, go through the sweat. She didn't have to get punched around. He did, Jesus did all that, gave it to us, so we're now we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We have access to the throne of God on a continual basis. Hebrews 2 and 6, he's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That means potentially we have heaven at our access or disposal all the time. All we have to do is go through the word and call on God, speak what the word of God says. We can expect God to move and manifest. But do we expect God to move and manifest? We should. Yeah, but yeah, no, no. It's not a, he's not a Billy Goat Christian. Yeah, but there's no, yeah, but there's no abbots. When I was young, it was Abbott and Costello. But no, no, no. God is God is who he says he is. We have to find out who he is because we need to get more intimate with God. The more we start focusing on him and worshiping him, taking time just to glorify him. But I don't feel like it. What's that got to do with it? Very rarely, rarely we ever feel like worshiping or feel like going to church or feel like magnifying God. No, because your body talks to you 24-7. Your mind will talk to you. So your spirit if you pay attention on the inside. But you, I don't feel like praising God today. Well, so people are governed by feelings then. Well, I don't think that's necessary. You're governed by your thoughts. 
We're supposed to be governed by, Father, your word says that we're supposed to offer the sacrifice of praise. Your word says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, magnify me or praise me or thank me in all things. So, Father, I, I choose to. I don't want to. In the, in the natural, I don't feel like it. But I choose to thank you and praise you in all things because you're God. I want to take time to acknowledge you and glorify you just because you're who you are and I have respect and reverence for you. I started doing it the other day. I was going to pick up Delaney. That, that, there's so many things happen. But I started out, I was going to pick her up. I'm going up 11. I started praying. Did I feel like to go into that morning? No, no. It seems, everything seems so heavy around me. It seemed like there was a big dark cloud. Instead of taking authority over the cloud, but I just started praising the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm going to thank you and praise you. I can go out and pick her up. And throughout the day, nothing seemed to go right. But I kept thanking him. I, it's easy to get disgruntled and discouraged when everything's going wrong. When the pressure seems to get you so much in your thought life and your, even your physical body, you feel like something is just smothering you, pushing you down. That's the time to praise him. Why? Psalm 22 and 3. He inhabits his praises. He, he, he's thrown upon his praises. So when we praise, heaven comes down. The glory comes down. So we are supposed to know, we're not supposed to be illiterate who God is. God, God wants and God expects us to know him. We're not supposed to be ignorant concerning the things of God or him. See, the more we know him, and I heard it was back in 2002, I guess we were down in Quincy, Illinois. Brother Hagin was down at that time. And uh, one of the things, I can't remember, I think it was Marty was teaching that morning, I think it was. But he said, you have to know God's character and his characteristics. And that's true. See, with every person, there are certain characteristics about you and things about you. Well, the more we know about God, the more we get intimate with him, you'll find out who he really is. Not what someone says or religion says or what's, what you might think. Well, I think I see God this way. Well, do you see him this way? This is the only way you can see him. Because the one on the inside of you will lead you in here so he will show you who he is and what about him. That's why if we... Again, if you go back to just some of the it's be fundamentals to God, but it's not to me. When he can measure in the palm of his hand the, the water, when he can measure, take a grain of sand, he can figure out the earth and the, to keep it in a rotate. I mean, a gravity, why people don't just fall off. <laughs> anyway, and how fast we spin, that's, that's amazing to me. The earth rotates very quickly. How, how many? It's, it's, it's not little. I guess that's why when planes fly certain directions, they got to fly, they go to the curvature. I mean, that's why when I first started flying in jets, I didn't like that too well. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, that's all I saw the subject. <laughs> but the more, but the more we, we know, because in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, is he, he's made us kings and priests. Kings are, are supposed to, we're supposed to have royalty, not over each other, over the devil. He has to bow to you and I. Priests worship. Priests are supposed to want to go. They would go in the sanctuary. They would worship God. We are kings and priests. So we're, God expects us then to worship Him. He's not going to force you to worship Him, but the desire in your heart. God created every person because you're a spirit. You have a desire for the supernatural. Well, some people get they go out to the occult. Or whatever they do. Some people worship themselves. They look in the mirror all the time, but they just love themselves. Well, it's, you're supposed to love yourself to a point, but not be, not be, you know, stupid. But they, they just, it's all, it's me, 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 me. No, no. That's why when people get married, it's no longer me, 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 it's us. I want my way. No, not in marriage. You're supposed to be, prefer, prefer the other one. Love prefers. Love gives. Love does not insist on its own right or its own way. Is that right? Amen. But you, too many, too many marriages. After I gotta have, I'm gonna have my way. That's all there's to it. Really? That's not, well, that's that. That means God's not God's not the center. When God's the center of the marriage, things go the way they're supposed to go. Because you go to Ephesians chapter five, Paul talks about. The man is supposed to be the head of the house, not the ruler of the house, 
telling his wife what she can do, what she can't do, when she can go, when she can't. No, no, no. That means the buck stops here. Like Adam had him complete authority. He could have stopped Eve from doing that. He did not. He could have kicked the devil out. He did not. Man has husbands that are subject to the Lord. That's why the wives are supposed to obey their husbands in the Lord. In the Lord. Not telling them what you can do, what you can't do. You, you can brush your teeth now. No. <laughs> Some people are just... Well, there was, there was a Pentecostal church up in, 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 in Wisconsin. They would tell people who they could marry. Or when they could go grocery shopping. I mean, Pentecostal people, are you, are you nuts or what? <laughs> I mean... Uh, uh, you know you, the pastor would tell you who you could marry. Really? <laughs> and you wouldn't, you would, you wouldn't think Pentecostal care or people hold filled with Holy Ghost to be that stupid. But the devil is stupid, and the devil deceives people. And see, that's why they get these new doctrines or these new things. And God is showing me because I'm, I'm the shepherd. He's, well, he's the under shepherd. He's not the shepherd. I'm an under shepherd, but I have to answer to the shepherd. My, my, I'm supposed to take care and feed the sheep and the lambs and take care of the sheep. That's my job. I'm supposed to watch over you all. I have responsibility for you all to love you, to feed you with the word of God so you can grow thereby. That you'll be fully blessed, fully armored, everything covered. That's my responsibility. Your responsibility is to find out what I say is true and, you have to, and you're obligated to act on it. But Jesus is the great shepherd. Pastors are under shepherds, but we're still supposed, we have to listen to him. But when you don't listen to him, pretty soon you get all these, well, I got this new revelation. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I was praying and fasting. You're right. Is it in the Bible? No, but I don't care. It's beyond the Bible. If you go beyond the Bible, you go beyond God. Because we know that in, uh, Jesus said, and well, let's, let's read it real quick. We have our time here. It don't matter, I guess. I'm not on a timetable. Maybe you are. Huh? There we go. That's true. We we quoted before. I want to I want to read it to you. John ten, ten. <sighs> The thief comes but for to seal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give you life and give you more abundantly. That's the, that's the new King James. But the Amplified says, I've come to give you life and give you more abundantly. Now, John chapter 12, and I believe it's verse uh, 31. Now, in the judgment of this world, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Well, we know 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan is the god of this world, little g. We also see in scriptures that God called, he, he says, ye are gods. Jesus said himself, you are gods, little g. Why you're created in the image and likeness? You're created to rule and reign over situations, not people. People don't bow down and worship you. No, I mean, in the, in the, when we were out to Evergreen for we were at Drama, but I was, wife and I were counselors, and one time we had to, after the minister prayed for people, we had a guest minister, and he prayed, and two of us men and took the guy. He always, if a guy was there, it was always. Two guys, never a, never a woman with a man privately. Anyway, the guy goes in there. The guy was supposed to be born again, filled with the Holy Ghost up there on, on the, from the minister or whatever. And he get back in the prayer room. <clears throat> and uh, as soon as I walked there, I go, he's a, holy, he's, a, he's a homosexual. I can smell the spirit. Spirits have an odor. Death has an odor. You walk in the hospital, you can smell it. I don't mean to mean the stuff they sanitize with. Spirits have an odor. Unclean spirits, they have an odor. You don't always see this. So, but I, anyway, as soon as I went to talk to him and pray for him, I touched him on the forehead. He dropped on the ground. He started withering like a snake. God's my witness. So was Lewis Tucker, my, my son's sex father in law. Anyway, the guy's withering like a snake. His tongue's going back and forth like a snake. You know? So I said, Lewis, I'll be right back. Little Lewis, I think he was scared. Oh, yeah. I said, Pastor, I said, we got some situation here. Can I cast that dumb thing out of him or whatever? You know, I have to get permission. He's the head, you know. Anyway, so I'll go back in there and I said, Stop that and get up in Jesus' name. So he 
got up and I said, first of all, you got to change your lifestyle. And he said, well, he said, no, no, I have God on inside of me. People have to worship me. I said, no, that's a lying devil. You don't worship another person. You go, you read that in scripture. Remember, he went down, bowed up, bow down to Peter. Peter said, no, and also in the angels in, in Revelation, you don't even worship, bow down to God. You don't, you don't bow down to man. No. Anyway, I said, you're not going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You're not, even, you're not even saved. I said, until you yourself right with God, you have a choice. If you want to live in this type of lifestyle, you may. God will not violate your will. If you want to be set free, I'll set you free. If you don't want to be set free. You can't help everybody. Those that want help, pray that they'll, God will deal with their heart. They will want help. But you can't force healing on somebody. You can't. I mean, I can cast a demon out of anybody. I don't. But once they leave or I leave, that thing comes right back. Then they're, then they're seven times worse. Read, read Matthew chapter 12. When spirits cast out a person, travels over dry ground, finds rest, seeketh none, comes back, finds a house swept and garnished, garnish, brings back seven more spirits with us in worse shape than it was at the very beginning. So I'm very careful when I cast demons out of people. The first few years, Robert, as we are born again, that's all we were doing. I'm thinking, dear Lord in heaven, it's all the demon, demon people around here. But I, I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. But people need help. You have to show me how to do it. Dear God, we had people from all over coming in. And it, God set them free. God set them free. And you taught them how to stay free. Huh? And then you taught them how to stay free. Yeah, because I said, because I, I can get anybody free. But if you don't stay, like that one that one young man I prayed for with Bishop one time up there, his parents were Pentecostal pre preachers, both of them from Dakotas. Anyway, he was continually trying to commit suicide. That's all he talked about and thought about. Anyway, so Bishop said one morning, so at work, he said, Well, you could pray with me after, after this word tonight. We'll pray for that guy. I said, Yeah, I'll go with you. We'll, we'll pray. Well, it was me who did the praying. He, Bishop just stood there. But anyway, <clears throat> we had kind of fasted and prayed. Now, you don't have to fast. Remember John's, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, when he said, This kind doesn't come up by prayer and fasting. That, that, that's the italics, the prayer of authority. Fast. Fast, devils don't, whether you fast or not, doesn't make any difference. It's the name of Jesus. He said, because of your faith. Anyway, the guy came down, this, he was a big guy. Hair, blonde hair down to his shoulders. I mean, he was strong. As, this guy, I won't go to what he, he was strong. He came down, he sat on the couch. I sat down beside him first, and the Lord said, stand up. He said, you don't put yourself on the same level as the devil. So I stood up, I got right in front of the guy. Before I started praying, I said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority of his violent spirit, because I knew he had one, because I was told that. He pulled a window right out of his frame. I'm, 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 that's supernatural. You don't do that. <clears throat> I bound up the violent spirit. I said, in Jesus' name, you will not touch anybody in this room. I bind you in Jesus' name. Render you harmless. As I was starting to pray, he grabbed hold of his, he started to pull his hair off his head. <laughs> yeah. But I got I cast the thing out of him. Now I said, that spirit of suicide, I said, I said, you need to get in church. He started coming to our church in Rockford up there, the, our home church. I said, you need to be there because the devil will come back. If you don't listen to what I'm saying, he'll come back. And they did for six months, and I don't know what happened. Anyway, but here, downstairs, here comes his wife. She goes, I'm going, oh, Jesus, Lord Jesus. <laughs> spirit of witchcraft. I'm going, really? <laughs> So I cast that dumb thing out of her. But it's not because, see, Jesus said in Matthew, Mark chapter 16, he said, these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons, and they'll speak a new tongue. I don't go around looking for them. There was a group in, in Ron McCoker years ago, back in the 80s. <laughs> they, they go out, look for demons under rocks. Now, come on. This is charismatic. I'm, just, I'm serious. You don't have to go look for them. They'll find you. They'll find you. But when people want help, yeah, you can help them. But you also got to get the word into them. They need to be in a church where they can hear the word. So whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But you got to know how to stay free. That's also, you got to know, once you're healed, you got to know how to keep your healing. Because the devil will try to bring symptoms back. He's a, he's a dirty cuss. He doesn't, he doesn't fight clean. But you have to realize, so that's what we have to teach people a good, solid foundation so they're not moved by what they feel, what they think, or what they see. Most of us are moved by what we see or think. And most of the time what we feel. <laughs>
<clears throat> in uh, Romans, I'm going to close with this, I think. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to start with verse 1. This is not where I'm after yet, but verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing we as believers should have is peace on continual peace. Remember, Jesus said, My peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives it, but when we're walking in fellowship with God, we should have peace continually. Otherwise, you have stress and fear and all kinds of other things boggling you down. We should have the, let the peace of God rule in your heart, the Bible talks about. Let's keep on going. Uh, it says also, verse 2, we have access through faith, the great grace, by which we stand and rejoice and hope at the glory of God. Let's jump down into verse uh, uh, verse 10. says, we were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, that through him we might receive and recon reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man's sin, and, and entered the world uh, death uh, through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when there's no sin, when there's no law, there's no sin, sin's not imputed. Nevertheless, death reigned uh, from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. In other words, the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus. But the free gift... It's not like the offense, for by one man's offense many die, but much more the grace of God, the gift of the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to many. And I want to jump down to verse, I think it's uh, 17. For by one man's offense, death reigned through one much more who received abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteous, will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. We're supposed to rule and reign in life through Jesus Christ. Rule and reign over the situations and circumstances that so easily beset us. Whatever attacks the devil comes, we're supposed to be ruler over those things. We have dominion over those situations. If we take our place in Christ Jesus, if you know who you are, who's in you, what you can do, what's expected of you, see, to whom much is given, much is required. So that's why some people don't want to know too much because then they're required. To, I'm serious. I've heard people say, I don't want to know too much because then I'll be responsible. <laughs> it goes over great with God. <laughs> no. <clears throat> so we're supposed to rule and reign. We're supposed to be kings and priests. We always call, he always calls us to triumph in Christ Jesus. We've been, made to, we've been made victorious through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're supposed to look at ourselves and we see the situation befall us and others. So when we go to others, we're supposed to be like a light that shines in darkness. We're supposed to be giving them great hope through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we focus on Christ and what he's done, what he's doing, what he will do, we can change lives that way. God wants you all to know who you are, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6 and 10, not in your own might. It's in his might, his strength. See, if you try to beat the devil in the mental realm, he'll whip you every time. Or the physical realm. But you keep him in the spiritual realm, You'll knock him out every time. He's a spirit being. Jesus dethroned him already. So in Jesus' name, and the word of God, we have authority and power. We have the blood of Jesus as a blood covenant. Therefore, he doesn't want you to know who you are. That's why James 4, 7 says, submit unto God. Then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Many people try to resist the devil. They don't, flee, they don't submit unto God. Submit unto God. Submit unto God in every area of our lives. As we praise him, worship him, obey him, Satan, we resist you in the name of Jesus. Because we submit unto our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. You're a defeated foe. It's like on the day of Pentecost. See, when Jesus walked the earth, he saw one man, one man. Spirit was alive unto God, full of the Holy Ghost and power. So if I just kill him, keep him out of the way, but by Jesus dying and being resurrected, now on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 little Jesuses born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Then that same day, there was 3,000 more added. The 3,120. Then pretty soon, the next day or so, there was 5,000 added. So we had 8,120. So he thought he was doing a good thing by getting Jesus off the earth. God's plan. Dummy, dummy, dummy. <laughs> he didn't play cards very good. He didn't, didn't know poker or something. Anyway, but anyway. <clears throat> so anyway, I guess we'll close with that. But but the, the, the point of it is, we're more than conquerors. God wants you to know what you can do. And we're supposed to be victorious in every situation because as the devil throws, as he knows his time is short, so he's going to throw all kinds of stuff at you to get you discouraged, disgruntled, mad, angry, every type of thing, and giving up on God. He wants you to give up on God. He, he don't care what you do as long as you're not doing, bring harm to his kingdom, but he hates your guts anyway because you're a child of God. You're creating God's image, but, but if you're not doing any harm, he don't really, don't really care. He'll use you and abuse you. Okay. Amen, amen, amen. I hope you're getting something out of this. Preach me happy. I don't know about you guys. I can go home happy now. <laughs> anyway, where am I going? Oh, yeah. Time to give our uh, offering. Uh, no, communion, communion. Communion. I'm looking at communion. <clears throat> And again, uh, anybody that's watching in, uh, those that are watching, the, the only requirements that are necessary to receive in communion is that you're, if you accepted Christ, you're a child of God. And it doesn't take much because Romans 8, 10, 8, 9, 10, so if you believe in your heart, confess your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you should be saved. So with the heart man believes in the righteousness, with, with the mouth salvation, mouth made, salvation made, confession made salvation. <laughs> So anyway, the only requirement is it's not what church you belong to, it's what family you belong to. It's the family of God when you when you accepted Christ, your Savior and Lord. And again, as, as they're passing out the elements, what they represent. And when Jesus, who is the Lamb, who was the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, but Jesus, when he took that bread on that night, on the, on the, the night he or you know, just be patient with me. <laughs> I'll get it. Huh? Better read it first. <laughs> Good idea. Oh, then why am I on 13? I don't know. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which was betrayed took the bread. When he had given thanks, he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. This do is often you drink it, and drink it, remember, so be. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, many are sick, and many die. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, before we partake of the, our covenant meal, the Lord's Supper, Father God, we judge ourselves, Father God, according to your word, First John 1, 7, 9, you said we would confess our sins. You're just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. So, Father, we thank and praise you right now. Father, we thank you and praise you now, Father God, that the blood of Jesus Christ totally annihilates, totally annihilates sin. So, Father God, we thank you because we're now sin-free, we're guilt-free. Your word says we should have no more sin consciousness because we've confessed it from our heart, not from the head, not thinking we can get by with something. So, Father, we thank you and praise you now. Our sins are forgiven. Father God, they're totally abolished in Jesus' name. So when he took the bread, he broke it. <clears throat> he said, this represents my broken body. Well, we know that he was whipped and scourged so badly and unmercifully. He paid a price for every sickness and every disease. It's not even named. So dear Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did. As we partake this day, we thank you that he belong, healing belongs to us now, sir, in your precious name.
keep hearing a ticking noise like computer typing or something. So Heavenly Father, he also took the cup and he raised the cup. He said, this is a cup of my blood. So dear Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood on Calvary's tree. Thank you for becoming our Passover lamb. Thank you, sir, that by your blood we've been bought. You bought us for strength of 6 and 20. We've been bought with a price, therefore we glorify you and our Father and our, and our body, which, which belong to you and our Heavenly Father. So Satan, take your hands off. We're blood bought, blood washed, blood cleansed, blood protected. So in Jesus' name, I'll partake. Now we'll take a baptized offering. <clears throat> So, Father, as, as, and again, a lot of times <clears throat> people have a problem with giving or tithing, but it's scriptural, it's been in the Bible, and some people try to find reasons, excuses why not to tithe because, well, you know, I, or after I pay my bills and I'm going to give a tithe. No, if you pay your bills first, you're giving an offering. Tithe comes first. And if you pay out of the top, off the top, that means God's involved in your taxes. So, but anyway, that's, tithe means a tenth. So when God... You pay God the tenth, what belongs to him, to all him. You're sowing a seed in the kingdom. He doesn't need your money, but he also tells what he needs, what he's supposed to bring the seed in for. So his storehouse might be full. <clears throat> but anyway, then we're supposed to be able to live abundant, super abundantly on the 90%. On the 90%. Amen. So Heavenly Father, your word says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, where will a man rob God? You said, yet you have robbed me, but I, we say, how? In tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse. Well, again, the person's cursed until they be obedient. The curse is still going to be there. You can pray for a person until they're blue in the face, you wear, wear all the hair off the head, or change anything until they change. You've robbed me in this whole nation. Bring the tithe into my storehouse. There may be food in my house, and my try me and are proving this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, coral blessings upon you, which is not room for you to contain, or for you to receive it all, I'll rebuke, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. So, Father God, we thank you and praise you now because we're as obedient sons and daughters of God, Father God, who come to sow our seed in the kingdom of God, Father God. We thank you, not only being obedient, but Father God, we know you're our supplier. We know Jehovah Jireh takes care of us as we're sowing seed. We can expect a rich, full, full, bountiful harvest. Doesn't matter what's going on around, doesn't matter the famine or anything else. Just like Abraham and Isaac. Doesn't matter. Still receive a hundredfold. So, Father, we thank you and praise you ahead of time, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, for, for years, when we first started ministry, I, I hated to take up tithes and offerings. I felt guilty about it because I didn't like doing that. I didn't like giving to begin with, but I didn't like taking it up. But then I see the Lord said one time, you're robbing people because if they're not sowing, they're being robbed of a blessing. So that's so I started changing my way of thinking. And I never used to think, you know, about ministers, you know, whatever. But the Bible says in Timothy that those that teach and preach the word are supposed to live by the word, but those that teach and preach are supposed to receive a double portion. I never, I've never looked at that that way. That's why when we first came back to Iowa, I used to work part time. Well, I figured I had to help the Lord out. He didn't call me to help him out. I was supposed to, I was supposed to trust him. Anyway, some people are slow learners. Yeah, you think someday I'd finally get on the bandwagon correctly, you think? Totally. I still have, I must have a few hang-ups. Anyway, Heavenly Father, as we lift this up to you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes, Father God. Father God, he fed. There was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it took up the baskets, 12 baskets left over, Father God. But you multiplied that seed. And also, the other time when there was seven loaves and a few fish, it took up seven baskets left over, Father God, feeding 4,000. But Father God... That's not including women and children, Father God. We thank you. You're a God of multiplication and addition. We thank you, Father God, because they've sown their seed in the kingdom. The seed is blessed now. Satan, you'll take your hands off the seed in Jesus' name. You'll take the hands off the harvest in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh. <clears throat> okay, I guess that's... Oh, I better pray for the people. Out. <clears throat> so, Father, I ask you, every person within the sound of my voice, if they, whatever need, and your word says, Father, you supply every need. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> there is no distance in the spiritual realm. Father, we thank you. Your Holy Spirit is ever present. In Acts 4 and 30, Father God, they prayed. Father God, you would stretch forth your hand to heal. 
The signs and wonders might be done by with and through the name of your holy child, Jesus. You would glorify and magnify Jesus, Father God. So we're asking right now, Father God, every person within the sound of my voice, no matter whatever they have a need of, you touch them from the top of their head, the soles of their feet, cause the power of God to permeate upon them, in them, and through them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. 